Welcome to the Etsy Conversations podcast, featuring inspiring interviews with Etsy shop owners, hosted by Ijama Elazu. Hi, and welcome to the Etsy Conversations podcast. I'm your host, Ijama, and I thank you for joining me for this episode of the podcast. This week, my guest is Elizabeth, and she runs the Etsy shop Felted Sky. She also has her own e commerce website. And you can find that at feltedsky.com. We'll jump into that part of the conversation um, as we talk. Elizabeth has been selling on Etsy since 2009 and over the course of that time has racked up over 28,000 sales across three shops. Right now, she's focusing primarily on Felted Sky, but doing so much more. And she's been doing this full-time since 2014. Elizabeth, thank you so much for being my guest and welcome to the podcast. Well, thank you, Ajama. I'm so happy to be here and um, I think you do a great job with the podcast. So I've listened to many episodes and um, I just want to thank you for what you do um, with the podcast. Thank you so much. I really do appreciate that and and I appreciate guests like you who come on and help me make the podcast possible. So before we get into our conversation, and we have so much to talk about because with, oh, let me see, over 10 years of selling experience, you've done a lot. And so I have so many questions for you about that. But before we do, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, how you got into needle felting and what you're doing now? All right. Well, um, let's see. I started selling on Etsy uh, when I was uh, a stay-at-home mom, and I had always had an outside part-time job of some sort, but um, I was really looking for a way to be at home um, and just be my own boss and do something more creative uh, while my kids were little. So I was just hoping to turn it into part-time income, I would say, Um, and I, I did what I called dabbling, kind of trying to figure that out for maybe four years before I really got serious um, and, you know, had things more figured out and started Felted Sky. Mm -hmm. So um, in terms of how I found needle felting, um, I was already into other fiber arts. I had learned knitting and I could crochet a little bit. Um, I could sew just a little bit. but uh, it was when my daughter went to Waldorf school. So oh, I don't know yeah. if you're familiar with Waldorf schools, oh, but yeah. they, mm-hmm. yeah, they teach traditional handcrafts to the kids uh, and they do a lot of art. Um, so they had all these needle felting supplies there. Most of the schools actually used to have a little shop where, you, where they would sell um, the handwork supplies and the different Waldorf toys because before the internet or even as it was coming in, you know, you couldn't just get them anywhere. Mm. Um, so anyway, they had all these supplies there and I would see other parents needle felting and I thought, well, this looks very interesting. I should try it. So, um, I guess it's just kind of one thing led to another. (laughs) And now here I am with this, with a whole house full of (laughs) wool and, um, yeah, all these, all these kits and things. So, yeah. And so at what point did you like, did you always have your eye on Etsy or did you try other platforms? No, I started on Etsy. Um, and I can't remember even how I heard on et- heard about Etsy um, in the beginning. But I had known at least one other mom from my breastfeeding group um, that was um, selling on Etsy and having some success. She was selling little baby shoes. Mm. Um, they were very cute at the time. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, somehow it was just in my realm of, of things. And, um, I thought, well, maybe I should just try this and start start putting things up. So, yeah. Back then, when, when you started doing it, did you envision it growing into a full-time business or did you just more want to just bring in some income to just help support your household? Right. It was, it was much more the part-time thing Mm -hmm. at the time. My husband had a a full-time job and I just needed to bring in part-time income. Mm -hmm. So 
I remember crunching numbers, you know, and looking at other sellers. And I think that's how more how I learned then. There weren't as many courses or like, you know, YouTube people putting out content and um, all this stuff on Facebook. So maybe there was, but I didn't know about it. I think there's a lot more now. Yeah. Um, so I pretty much just studied other successful shops and it was, it was like a pipe dream to like get to one sale a day, you know, crunch numbers and think, well, how much would I have to sell, you know, to make what we need and like how many sales a day would that be? And um, yeah, so for a long time, that just seemed like, you know, that would be the greatest thing ever would be to have one sale a day, you know. <laughs> So I'm guessing that you did because that was on your mind to get one sale a day. Um, how, how was the ramp up? How soon did you start getting sales and, and um, what was the trajectory of, you know, your, the growth of your shop? So it was definitely, I think about those, those four years where I was just kind of learning, mm -hmm. um, and my first sale, I think I got after maybe about a month, I was trying, I was selling different things to try and figure out what was going to work. And I, my first sale was actually, I still remember it because it's so embarrassing. Um, <laughs> I, I think I lost like something like $42 on oh my, my first goodness. sale um, because I was, I wanted that first sale so badly. I was running a sale and I was offering free shipping. Oh, and okay. the first customer asked if I would still do the free shipping if I shipped to Europe to her sister. Oh. Not knowing how much shipping my item to Europe would be. <laughs> I said, yes, because I just wanted that first sale. And um, anyway, it was so much that I lost <laughs> money. Yeah. So. I hope you at least got a good review. <laughs> I think, I think she did give me a good review. I don't remember, but yeah. uh, that was the first sale. So I've come a long way since yeah. losing $42. I bet. In the first one. Um, but anyway, I, I don't really remember when I hit one sale a day. Mm. I was getting probably somewhat regular sales at the end of that four years. But okay. I had tried selling. The first, the first items were diaper cakes, cloth diaper cakes. Oh, yeah. and a very odd niche but people had asked me to make some so that's what gave me the idea anyway then I sold some little decorative things made with upcycled sweater felt and then I just was selling the sweater felt and then I finally started doing the needle felting and selling some finished items and then really just other stuff that I was making some wooden toys that I would wood burn or paint mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, it was a wide range. <laughs> so and were these all in the different shops? Because over you, I know you've had three shops on Etsy. Yes. I've had three okay. shops. These were all just in the, the first shop. So okay. I didn't really pick a niche. I was just trying to figure out what was going to work, but it was all kind of somewhat eco-friendly or like Waldorf inspired, I would say mm -hmm. after the diaper cakes. <laughs> okay. So speaking about finding your niche, it, it sounds like you took some time to try different things and then you eventually hit on one that you're good at, you enjoy, and that you're able to make a profit on. What tips can you give to um, another seller right now who is listening and is kind of floundering around and hasn't yet found their feet in a specific niche? Right. That's, that's a good question. So I think what I eventually landed on was that I could have been happy in any number of fiber arts. Mm -hmm. You know, I could have been a weaver or a dyer of yarn or, um, done knitting or embroidery, mm -hmm. but, um, needle felting at the time, I just happened to figure out because of, I mean, it's kind of a long, a long backstory, but I just happened to figure out that needle felting, um, on Etsy, people were searching for the supplies and for kits or whatever, but there wasn't, it wasn't very saturated yet mm -hmm. at all. It was like wide open. Um, so, um, that was really what, um, kind of helped with the decision. I think a lot of people start out 
being an artist or knowing what they love to make. And then they think, how can I sell this? Yeah. I kind of went about it the other way of what are the customers looking to buy, you know, that is not saturated yet, that has this growth potential and where I can still be found relatively easily, like if my products stand out. Okay. So, right. So I never really went about it in terms of, you know, I have to make this thing and figure out how to sell it. It was more, um, what does the market look yes. like? Like, where can I yeah, plug myself into that? And for sure, I, I always hear that that's a good strategy, which is um, find a gap or a hole in the market and then fill it. When you did that, because I think that's essentially what you did. Did you use any tools or was it just a matter of paying attention to what you were seeing on the platform? It was, um, yeah, I would say it was about, it was partly paying attention. There were a few other needle felting shops I kind of had become aware of that I was watching, I would say. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but the main thing was I, and this just kind of all happened this way. Um, at the Waldorf School, I was volunteering in that school store that I mentioned where they had all these supplies. Mm -hmm. And the, I was kind of friends with the person running the store, and uh, they needed more sales. Like the sales meant, you know, more money for the school, mm -hmm. you know, kind of a little bit of a fundraiser. Mm -hmm. So I said, you have all these supplies sitting here and we don't sell through a lot of them. You know, why don't you put them on Etsy and see if you can sell some on Etsy? Because it'll just help you bring in a little more, you know, revenue. Mm -hmm. So um, so I, I actually helped them set up their Etsy store and I took pictures oh, and I nice. helped make the listings and I did all this stuff. And I hadn't really found my niche yet. Mm -hmm. And. So that, you know, it started selling for them just this wool, you know, the supplies yeah. for needle felting. And after a couple of months, I'm, you know, saying to myself, I just set them up with this great <laughs> like, thing. Like, why aren't I doing this? <laughs> um, so then, but it took maybe, a, it was maybe nine months or a year after that, that I started more into the niche because I didn't want to compete with them at that yeah. point. Yeah. Um, but they ended up, um, that the school store changed and they weren't doing as much with it. And one thing led to another. So I thought, well, I won't be competing with them. So mm -hmm. I should really get into this now. So oh, nice. And so from running their, their Etsy store, you learned about the platform and what works and doesn't work, I would assume. Well, I actually, this was after, like I had been on Etsy selling my random oh, mix okay. things for maybe three years by this point. Okay. Okay. Um, so, and I just set up the store, um, mm -hmm. the, the person managing their, um, their little school store actually did all the fulfillment and did everything. I just helped okay. you know, do the listings okay. and the pictures. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. Okay. All right. And then speaking of just spending time selling online, you also, in addition to Etsy have, have done what a lot of sellers either are doing or contemplating doing, which is expanding beyond just the Etsy marketplace. And you've run your own websites outside of Etsy. Currently you're on Shopify, but you, you have experience with some platforms that I know we haven't talked too much about on the podcast. You've run a website on WordPress as well as Big Cartel, which I don't think, I think maybe we've mentioned like once or twice, what were those experiences like and w why did you end up settling with Shopify? So the WordPress site was a site I originally had built um, for Felted Sky when it was um, new. Mm -hmm. And I thought I was going to end up selling through that, you know, on my own and with wholesale but I never ended up even using it really. It was just kind of had basic stuff on it, but I didn't sell through it um, because I, we haven't gotten into this, but I kind of switched niches. I did a, I did a niche pivot even after I started Felted Sky. Oh. So, um, so that website just kind of sat there, but I didn't really like WordPress. I have to say when I was getting it set up and trying to start using it, 
it wasn't very intuitive or easy. I just didn't, you know, compared to Etsy, I just didn't like it mm. uh, as a platform. Um, but then, so I pivoted into this other niche, which was selling the wool and really just the wool. And then I got into selling some felted and knitted and other things, but to uh, newborn photographers. Yeah. So that all came out of Felted Sky. I realized I had this whole other customer base that were starting to buy wool from me, but they were using it for something completely different, which was a photo prop versus felting with it. Mm -hmm. um, so at the time I needed more income and that was just like this hotter niche. Um, so I kept doing the needle felting, but my focus really shifted for maybe three years or so. Oh, wow. Yeah, so it was a big pivot, uh, and that's what allowed me to go full-time was when I found the newborn photography niche. Um, they are very Facebook-driven. Um, so that really ran on Facebook tags is how they all found me. Oh, does that – does when you say Facebook tags, does that mean you were doing – Facebook ads? No. So in, in newborn photography, and this was maybe 2014, mm -hmm. um, when this all happened, um, I realized I had these, this kind of other customer base ordering, starting to order for me. And I thought there's a lot of energy here. And I, my photographer that, that takes, or that took my pictures at the time for felted sky, um, I had her to kind of ask about it. So she said, oh, yeah, this is a big thing. And these photographers buy a lot of props, you know, and for them, it's a business expense. So they have these large prop collections mm -hmm. and there's a lot of energy around it at the time. So I needed to figure out, like, how do I break into that extra market? Because it's basically the same product that I already have, but a whole new way to sell it or a whole new mm -hmm. customer base. Mm -hmm. Um so anyway, I threw a, another kind of serendipitous chain of events. Um, I ended up connecting with um, arguably the best newborn photographer in my city at the time, and she was well connected. So, so she said, send, this is kind of how it worked, you know, at the time in that niche, you send free product to, they were her friends but her friends that she had me send the free product to were five of the best newborn photographers in the world. Wow. And, and so in, in this niche, if they, they, they are posting all the time on Facebook mm -hmm. or they were. Um, so if they use your product in their photo, then they'll tag your business page. Mm -hmm. So then it was literally like the first tag that I got from one of them, you know, I basically sold out of all of my inventory in about like 24 hours. It was, oh it was like, wow. so, so then it just kind of rolls on tags. So you, you still send some free product out to get tags from, you know, the really, the ones that have huge followings. These yeah. are like 200,000 followers or whatever. Yeah. Um, but even the ones that have a few thousand followers tag you. So there's just people constantly kind of seeing your stuff through that way. Oh, I see. Okay, that makes sense. So, it's so I end up using some Facebook ads toward the end, your organic reach. I feel like Facebook also, you know, kept changing things and kind of the organic reach kept going down. Mm -hmm. But I didn't have to do a, a lot of Facebook advertising. Okay. Do you still... Do you still cater to that market? No. So it was very interesting. That that was really big for, for me for maybe three years. And then the sales kind of started declining. Like they held very steady um, for that time. And then they started going back down. Um, so, but in the, in the meantime, the needle felting has continued to kind of be on the upswing. Okay. So um, by the time those sales were declining, I was thinking, gosh, there's more happening in needle felting. Maybe needle felting is at the point where it can support me without, you know, kind of this extra other thing that I didn't ever anticipate, yeah. you know. So that's more what happened. So we switched 
it, it they ran together, you know, for for a while, but now um, we're just doing felted sky. I like how you're very fluid with your niches. Like you don't box yourself in and, and it sounds like you've been able to um, benefit from that in that, you know, you're there, you're, you know, if, if a wave comes along, you'll ride it and you know when to get off because I know some sellers and I've, I've been guilty of this too. Um, when something just isn't working anymore rather than figuring out what works and moving on, um, just holding on for longer than we should. And it seems like you're good about, okay, it's time to wrap this up and move on knowing that point. Right. I'm hoping the needle felting is, has more longevity, but yeah, that, and I actually named the other shop when I split it off from Felted Sky, I named the other shop Oh So Fleeting, because <laughs> I kind of even had the sense at the time of like, I don't know how long this is going to last, but here I am, you know. So. What What does it look like to, or what did it look like for you to close down a shop? Um, It kind of, it wound down kind of organically, so... I just stopped coming out with new products. Mm -hmm. You know, there had to be sales to kind of sell off um, the invent, you know, the inventory I had. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, I still was doing some pre-orders even this year, where you know there were still some customers that wanted to to get stuff. Okay. So, um, I would post on my Facebook, you know, a pre-order of, okay, you can order right now for the next week and then we'll make it and ship it to you. Okay. But I didn't want to be holding on to that extra inventory. Okay. Right. Um, so that's kind of how it wound down. Okay. Well, good to know. Now, one thing you mentioned was you said at the time somebody was doing your photography, do you still outsource your photography? And if so, how do you go about picking who to assign that to? Yes. So this is one of my things that I always tell new sellers. Um, I know I've, it seems like a lot of people want to try and learn to do their own photography. Yeah. And I think it's just a huge learning curve. And I don't know if, unless, unless you end up being very talented at photography, um, I don't know that you ever quite get to that level of a really a really well done professional, you know, photo. Okay. Um, so for me, I just have always invested in my photography, um, not for the first four years when I was figuring things out, but once I was serious, you know, um, and I just knew I needed the best photos, you know, if it was going to work. So um, that photographer, I've only had two photographers and the first one would still be my photographer, but I moved and she moved. And then obviously we weren't in the same place. Yeah. So, um, she was just a mom that I knew and I had known of her work for a while. Cause again, we were in the same like play groups and stuff. And she was just really good, a really good natural light photographer. And she knew Etsy and kind of new trends mm -hmm. and what I needed. And it was a fairly good deal because she was, you know, do it just doing part time photography for the most part because she was raising her kids. Mm -hmm. um, so I've always paid by the hour. Okay. I think that is the key. And I, I kind of know what I need. I'm good at styling my photos. So I go into I go into every session knowing you know exactly what photos I want to get, mm -hmm. and kind of with that idea of how I want them styled, like how we're doing it. Um, so it can be we can you know do a lot of photos in an hour, so that kind of makes it more cost effective. Okay, and and you mentioned the first person you you outsource to, you both live near each other. I yes. assume that's a key ingredient in outsourcing when you have a physical product is to be within a close proximity to who, whomever you're outsourcing it to, because you have to, you have to get the products to them. Um, do they end up keeping the products? Do you have any input in the, 
in the staging at all or you really just hand over the products and and give them free reign I mean, I, I think there's different ways to do it. So I've heard of people even shipping product. I think if you had, you know, if it was jewelry or something small, you could probably do that and they ship it and just take whatever they get. Like they probably say a little bit about what kind of styling they're looking for and whatever, but someone just takes it and photographs it. And then in that case, maybe some people keep the stuff and that's, you're kind of bartering for the photos, but otherwise it probably all gets shipped back. Okay. Um, but that's not what I have done. Um, yeah, I have picked someone that was close by. Okay. So I literally fill up my van, you know, or whatever with all the stuff that I need photographed and we go. And now I take my husband too, because it makes it a lot more efficient to have three people rather than two. Yeah. Um, but I do a lot of the styling. Like I really know the setups that I want. And um, so it's, it's more of a partnership. Like the photographer can say, well, this looks good or this doesn't quite look right. Let's move this or change this or okay. so it's a partnership. But yeah, I, I pretty much know what I want when I'm going in. Okay. So does that mean you also have to have like a, a full set or like a, a full product line or number of products that you intend to sell already ready, at least your samples Yes, that's okay. how I do it. Okay. I, yeah, I, I put out products in batches. Okay. So I'll do, and I'll do a lot at once okay. and I'll get all the photos done at once. And then um, I do the photographer for me, um, they do batch editing. So they'll just edit like for the color and the, you know, the brightness or whatever. Um, but then I crop and resize myself. Okay. So that I think also helps on the pricing probably. Now, because you do batch products, does that, have you found that that um, helps your creative process or does it sometimes impede your creative process if you have an idea for a new product or product line and you're not in that phase of production. Maybe you're in the photography phase or, you know, you've just finished one line. Does that make sense what I'm asking? Yeah, it does. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I mean, I'm always getting new ideas mm -hmm. and I'm the kind of person that has way more ideas than I have time to do yeah. or that we have space in the house mm -hmm. to hold the inventory. Mm -hmm. So um, so we're still out of our home for now. Mm -hmm. Um so, yeah, the ideas just kind of have to percolate until I can get to them. Yeah. And right now I'm wrapping up like the prototyping and a new new product development. Uh, and it's gotten way pushed back. Like I feel like it should have been done, you know, in June. <laughs> yeah. But the way this year has gone, it's just mm -hmm. like lagging. Um, so, yeah, the products just have to percolate. A lot of these ideas I had a year ago and they're just oh, now... Nice coming to fruition, I would say. Oh, wow. Okay. So, so you have a long way to go. There's still a lot more lifespan left in felted sky. I think so. Yeah. I, and it's partly because of needle felting. It's just such a young fiber art. Mm -hmm. I think it's only been around maybe 40 years. Oh yeah. So it's very different than like embroidery or knitting. Um, yeah. Uh, there's always new things to do because they just haven't been done yet. They haven't been done yet. That's great. Yeah. Now, one thing you mentioned, you said that um, it helps when your husband comes to help with the photography. Can we talk about that? Because I know like within the last two or three years, he's been able to now come and work with you on your business full time. So how how did that happen? When did you know it was, it was a good time to bring him on and to expand your business with, you know, other, um, either employees or independent contractors? Right. So when I was doing the newborn photography shop, um, primarily, um, I wanted to offer things that matched the wool. So I was selling the wool just kind of by itself, but, um, I've learned about myself that I 
really like the design of the new products and the new ideas, but I don't like making the same things over and over again. Mm -hmm. Um, so I've gotten around that by, you know, in felted sky, I offer kits, but in the photo prop shop, I ended up bringing on independent contractors. So, um, we were doing cute little hats that were knitted and then they would get little felted ears or felted antlers or things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, So I had already, you know, been working with, you know, how do I get other people to make some of my stuff? Mm -hmm. Um, And then when my husband came on, I think it was when we were moving, when we moved to um, Ann Arbor, where we are now, uh, the cost of living is higher. And basically just our expenses were going up and the, the newborn photography income was going down a bit. Um, and we were looking at, should he get an outside job again? Um, yeah. Or should, you know, we kind of were having the idea of either he's got to get another outside job or if, if he goes full time with felted sky and we're really going to grow the needle felting business that would allow us to grow it. Yeah. So it was a gamble, but it just felt like we wanted to try it. We just really both like being entrepreneurs and yeah, that helps too. Home. Yeah. So, so he handles the, um, kind of more of the back end, the inventory management, okay. which now we have a lot of inventory and we have barcodes on it all. And we're, um, have the inventory management software. And, um, so it's, it's fairly complex and he's yeah. setting up all of that kind of, so it, it works. Okay. Um, so he's doing more of that. And then, yeah, he does just help out as needed with, you know, other stuff. How is it working with family, uh, you know, working with your spouse and um, just people that are more a part of your life than just the business? Right. So I would say um, for us, we in general really like it. Um, it works for us. We have a a very solid relationship, but I mean, it is tricky sometimes and it is tense sometimes. Mm -hmm. And I think that's just, you have to kind of weigh the pluses and benefits and your, your, you know, unique, you know, relationship. So, um, the biggest challenges we have are when we don't agree on what we need to do Mm -hmm. (laughs) for the business or, you know, like, I wanted to cut down on our number of colors of wool because we have 192 colors, oh, wow. three sizes. I mean, it's just like a lot. Um, and he was just adamant that like, you know, we, we can't cut down our color palette because, you know, for artists, like the color palette is everything. Yeah. So um, anyway, his brain just thinks about things differently than my brain does. So it's just been kind of, you know, an interesting journey of figuring out that we need to just use the kind of the best of, of how our, how our brains work, Mm -hmm. um, try and try and figure out what to do using kind of both of our perspectives. Yeah. So. Okay. Now, speaking of figuring things out, one thing you mentioned, just backtracking a little bit was that he handles your inventory management and and the software that you use and and now when you just mentioned how many colors you have you know of of the of the felted wool yeah it's the wool yeah yes how do you keep track what inventory management system do you use and and how how did you pick it how how is it working for you now And can we just talk about that? Because that seems like in and of itself a a huge task. Yes. So when we started looking, um, you know, obviously we just need to manage all of this inventory more efficiently Mm -hmm. because we didn't really have a good tracking system before. It was kind of just like, well, we go down to the shelves and we see what looks low, you know. (laughs) Um, but that's not very efficient or it doesn't always, you don't always catch things before they run out, Mm -hmm. um, with this much stuff. So 
We were basically looking for someone that would sync the inventory between Etsy and Shopify, since I'm on Shopify now. Mm. Um, and yeah, that could just help us track everything. So um, a lot of the software that we found just trying to Google search um, seemed out of our price range. Okay. So we had to kind of sift through and find ones that were more reasonably priced. Um, it seems like they're all pretty much by the month now. Yeah. So we started out with one called Prima Seller, um, and we thought that was going to work, um, but it kept just kind of having glitches and it issues. So we recently switched to one called Trunk. Okay. So that... Um, so far, seems like it's going to work. It doesn't have quite as many reports or bells and whistles, but just the basics of it um, seem pretty solid. What, what was the learning curve with it like? Um, well, I can't speak a lot about that because it's my husband. Oh, that's that's right. It, yeah. But he's kind of wrestling with it right now, but he's setting up these very complex like things for it to do. So uh, like, like we sell kits. So each kit might have 15 components. Mm -hmm. And um, so he's not tracking how many kits we have actually on the shelf that are all put together. He's tracking the components. Mm -hmm. And then when we sell a kit, it deducts one of each of those components. Mm -hmm. And that's how he figured out was better. He thought would be better for us to keep track of everything. Okay. So he's had to set all that up, um, and he's even now tracking, I think, the paper labels that go on each little roll of wool <laughs> that's in each oh. kit. Like, he's got it down to very uh, minute detail. Wow, yeah. It sends him, it sends him reports of everything that, that's low. Every day he gets, like, a, okay. a report. So he's got to set up, you know, when does he want it to tell him that mm -hmm. we're low. So. Um, and then he's trying to figure out how to get those reports into a special spreadsheet he's built so that he can kind of keep track of, have I, have, you know, have we ordered this or have yeah. we sent this out to an employee to roll and when is it coming back? And yeah. I don't know, it's, it's a lot. <laughs> I, I, I can only imagine, but I, I also feel like that would be, that's going to be very useful for you come uh, the busy, you know, holiday selling season when things ramp up, because I know one of the things that a lot of sellers end up falling short on is inventory to, to make what they're selling. And sometimes, you know, when it gets really busy, that can be a big problem. For sure. Yeah. So we're really been building kind of the foundation to scale the business more for the last two years, I would say this year and last year. So, right. We want to, we want to be able to continue to grow it. So we needed all of these extra systems. And speaking of inventory, I'll just pop in with this, that um, this year when COVID happened, yeah. you know, it's really disrupted supply lines and we were stuck in the spring. We had a huge spike in orders, but we did run out of things. Yeah. Um, probably three different times we ran out of key components so we could not sell our best selling <laughs> stuff because we just didn't oh, have it. So, yeah, it is, it's very tricky right now to know how much inventory to keep on hand. Right. And with the volume that you're doing, I would imagine you're, well, obviously you're not buying retail. Um, so as far as sourcing, how do you decide and and how do you find good partners to to um do business with to get you know your raw materials and ensure that you know you you always do have what you need in stock um i would say it's a process and i've been learning a lot um since last year we really started buying more in bulk and larger amounts of things mm -hmm. so it usually starts with me having an idea of what I need and then I go out online and research and look for it. Mm -hmm. And um, for example, in the case of our kit boxes, I wanted to move to boxes. They used to be in plastic bags. Um, so 
So I, I knew I needed a very specific size and I wanted it to be white. And um, there just really aren't any that I could have made in the U.S. or that came ready-made that were exactly what I needed. So for the boxes, I ended up going to Alibaba and finding um, a company that makes them in China. Okay. So I don't particularly like sourcing from China, but it was kind of one of those, I can't afford what I can have made in the U.S. Yeah. <laughs> so um, anyway, so now we get two things that I've sourced through Alibaba. And that was just kind of looking at reviews, sending out a number of messages to different companies and then seeing which ones got back to me and had the better customer service. Okay. And yeah. And then we get hoops from England, embroidery hoops. Um, cause they're just, they're just beautiful. <laughs> it's, it's a problem now cause the international shipping has, has skyrocketed this year. Um, but it's usually just me searching for things that, um, that I need. And most, most of our stuff comes from the U S but there's a okay. few things that, that don't. I remember when I used to sell on Amazon and Alibaba was one of the places that, you know, a lot of sellers on Amazon, not handmade sellers, but like, if you want to put together like, um, your own products to sell on Amazon. Alibaba was where, you know, we would go to find manufacturers and what have you. And part of the reason I got out of that was because you can get burned very easily um, when you're making, when you're trying to do something more intricate. And I know some sellers who would actually fly to China to visit the factories, to look at their process and and whatnot before they would do business with them um i assume you didn't do that no i didn't do that and i think it's it's just kind of a gamble like that first yeah. that first time i sent off that big chunk of money because you know the minimums are usually a thousand units mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um you know you have to just hope that, <laughs> that the product is going to show up yes and, and there's always a learning curve like i didn't know like the way to ask for the shipping where they've paid the extra um, like customs fees yeah. or like, and it's built in when they give you the shipping quote. So, you know, after my product arrived, you know, in a month I got a bill from FedEx for like an extra $600 yes. of <laughs> like yeah. the customs fee on the order. Like, Oh, I didn't know I needed to cover that. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> so, um, I, I guess I've just been lucky, but I just, kind of went with the ones that had solid reviews and that seemed to have that good customer service. Um, so, yeah. you know, okay. so far we haven't had any major problem. Okay. That's good. Now in felted sky right now, like you mentioned, you've mentioned already, you're selling the needle felting kits and supplies and you put these all together. You, you talked about um, just the intricate system that you use for, or your husband is using for the inventory management. So I'm sure because you're putting the kits together, you also need um, um, equipment to help with the packaging and labeling and making everything look nice and professional. How do you go about finding what equipment you need to use and and um, sourcing that and, you know, either buying or what have you? Um, so basically right. I'm talking about, yeah, how do you figure out the equipment you need and work that into your system? So I think it's just kind of by necessity we've been figuring out things over time. Um, we, we have a lot of printed material that goes into the kit. So they each get um, two pieces of paper that are color printed on each side. Um, that's the instruction sheet and a little beginner guide. And then we, we have a sticker front that goes on the box, like as the label. And then that needed to be um, a high quality color copy. So at first, when I first started, um, 
I was using an online website called Best Value Copy um, because their prices were just very good for color copies. Um, But then as we were doing so much more volume, it just became too unwieldy to try and order what we thought we would need in advance and then wait for it to be printed and get to us. Um, And then also with the sticker label, when we moved to that for the, um, the box, uh, that could not be printed by them. I had to order labels. Um, I like the website online labels. That's where I get my sticker labels. Okay. Um, so anyway, I would have to order those and then take them to our local um, FedEx and have them printed because we didn't have a printer that mm-hmm. was a good enough um, quality. So anyway, as our volume went up, you know, the FedEx prices are also very high for right. color print. So um, we finally figured out we were we were thinking we needed to buy kind of an expensive color printer. Um, but we ended up somehow finding that there's a Canon showroom for businesses where you go and look at the Canon copiers. And I mean, uh, the other, you know, Xerox and the other companies have this as well, but okay. ended up with Canon and you can lease um, a, you know, like a business class color copier printer. So, um, that is actually, that was much more economical than, you know, trying to buy one of these machines outright that could do what we needed. Um, So we pay a monthly lease fee and then there's a small charge per copy. So they tabulate how many copies you're running, Um, but the toner's included and any maintenance is included. So if it breaks or it's not working, they send out their person to fix it. Oh, and you don't have to buy the toner. They send that to you too. They, yeah, the toner is included because we're paying, I think it's maybe five cents or eight cents. I can't remember exactly, but we're, we're paying that per color copy. Oh, that I see. The toner. So by leasing this the canon copier you've been able to pull in all those um the all the outside printing you were doing in-house right so we can print what we need when we need it and when we worked out when we kind of crunched the numbers um this was definitely the best option fantastic how so that was thing, yeah, we just like who knew, you know? Who knew? Seriously, who knew? And was this a local warehouse in your area? Uh yes, it was about a half an hour from us, but I okay. think they have these in every major city. And, and so you have to just call and get an appointment and they assign a rep to you okay. and that you go in and they show you what the different models can do and they printed oh. test copies for us and then they have to you know, get you a quote and you go through all this kind of paperwork. Um, but then it just shows up. <laughs> right. And then they set everything up for you. Yeah. So it's, um, it's set up in, in my husband's little office space. Yeah. Um, the one thing we didn't anticipate was that it puts out like these copier fumes, you know? Um, so, I don't know. We're kind of a little bit chemically sensitive. Like I'm just eco-friendly and I don't, yeah. I don't know what chemicals it is, you know, spewing, but it's definitely putting out something that smells that, you know, anyway. So then we had, then we bought an expensive air filter to put in the room with oh. it. <laughs> we were worried about like what we're breathing. Oh yeah. So oh. Anyway, if we ever move into another space, we have to design some little copier room that has like good ventilation yeah. and like filtration. The things you learn as you grow. The things you learn. Um, so anyway, other equipment um, that we're investing in now, um, we now that we can print all of our labels, we also print labels that we wrap around all of our wool. It's kind of like when you buy yarn, you know, it has a little paper oh, label. Yeah. Yes. That, So we're just printing those and then they needed to be cut into the right sizes. Um, And we used to take that cutting to the local FedEx um, print shop. 
and they have, you know, a big paper cutter where they can cut, you know, to a stack of 200 at a time. Mm. Um, so that's so much more efficient than us trying to cut it, you know, like with a rotary cutter, or, you know, one of those yeah. machines, uh, one of the little ones. So anyway, but when when COVID happened, they stopped taking in outside printing for cutting. So now they'll only cut what they print there, which again is too expensive um, for us anyway. Yeah, yeah. So we ended up buying um, a paper cutter. Like an industrial one? Yeah, it's kind of an industrial paper cutter. I mean, it's not it's not to the level of what they have at FedEx, yeah. but it, it will cut a stack of two hundred papers. Okay. So that was that was an investment. And then we're also probably soon going to invest in a paper folder because our instruction sheets get folded and folding them by hand oh, is becoming right. um, too much. Wow. So, yeah, it's just my husband is all about efficiency. So even though we have these upfront expenses, he's thinking over time. Over time, yeah. You know, putting a, a big stack of paper in the paper folder and it just gets done is much easier than us folding them or paying our employees to fold them. Like that's just something that the the machine can do. Yeah. So. Wow, the things you learn as you grow and expand, and and I like that you. You, you mentioned investing in all this equipment because, uh, you know, the upfront investment rather, because I know a lot of sellers are hesitant to put put a lot of money out upfront in the in anticipation of growing. But sometimes like in your case, I just feel like you don't really have a choice um, because of where you you already are on your growth chart you need right. to do this to continue to grow. Otherwise, you you might not just be stunted. You might actually just, you know, start going backwards. Right. That's kind of how it feels at this point. And yeah. it took a long time to get there. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is 11 years in. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, our volume really, really, you know, increased last year because we started doing more wholesale. So that okay. that's really kind of bumped us up over over the edge of like, wow, we really need to change the way we're doing this stuff because mm -hmm. it's just too hard to keep up otherwise. And speaking of selling wholesale, this is not through Etsy because Etsy doesn't offer the wholesale, um, the wholesale platform anymore. Mm -hmm. How did you get your wholesale customers? So a few of them just find me. Okay. Um, my first one that I've had the, the longest, that's probably orders the most regularly, mm -hmm. um, they found me at a fiber festival that I did in person mm -hmm. where I had a booth. Um, I think the first year I was out vending anywhere with my new kits and things. Mm -hmm. um, so they just found me. Some people find me on Etsy. They're just searching Etsy for something that looks like they want to carry it. Okay. Um, so I do get some inquiries through Etsy, um, but then the rest, uh, the big bulk of them came from a trade show that we did last year. Mm. So um, I had heard other people talking about trade shows. I think I saw um, someone else in the needle felting niche had been to this particular trade show the year before I went and the little light bulb just kind of went off like, well, wait a minute, like I should be going to that trade show. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, when we, when my husband came on, we really totally revamped the product line. We changed the packaging, we changed the pricing, and we really wanted to be able to have those wholesale customers mm -hmm. so that we could buy in bulk and kind of get to that volume where we could get some of our component prices down. Okay. Um, so anyway, so the trade show was a big deal. Um, and I don't know that we were ready to go. We were still in the midst of like reworking the whole product line and we didn't have our inventory management figured out. Um, but it was one of those like, well, we need the extra income and we have this opportunity. So we just, we got to go for it. Wow. But it was very rough. I mean, just overwhelming kind of crazy year last year to be 
changing so much and figuring out so much at the same time that we got a bunch of wholesale customers. Um, but now we, are you at a comfortable place with it? Yes, I would, I would say things are much more comfortable right now. Uh, we're still figuring some more out, like fine tuning the inventory management and okay. stuff like that. But yes, uh, at long last, <laughs> <laughs> the, the house is kind of put back together and things are running smoothly and we got a few employees and yeah. things are, are evened out. But um, when we went to that trade show, we had no idea what to expect. Mm. And again, that was another kind of a risk or a gamble of like, we're going to spend this money to go and we don't really know what we'll get out of it. But we ended up with 40 <gasps> wholesale customers from the Whoa. line. So, so that was, lo- yeah. looking back on it now, what advice would you give yourself now going into it? How would you tell yourself to prepare? And and basically, how would you tell and you know that seller who's listening right now that feels ready to expand to prepare for this type of trade show? Well, the first thing would be have your product line really solid (laughs) and your your processes in place to handle a jump in volume before you actually get the jump in sales. Um, But I don't know why. I think it's just the kind of person I am. Maybe it's like I, I almost need like to have the pressure of getting stuff done to get the stuff done. So we were trying to have everything done before we went to the trade show, but I I think everything just takes like three or four times longer than you think it's going to take. Mm. Um, But it, you know, if we had had the time to get everything kind of more solid before we went, that would have been helpful for sure. Mm. But um, let's see, it would be nice. Like we, we actually hadn't even gotten like we were we were just getting the products finished to take. Um, so and our whole booth design and all of that, you know, just came together at the very last minute. So when we got there, we had forgotten to actually make an order form <laughs> to oh. write down the orders. Mm-hmm. So um, anyway, so we were writing down orders just in my notebook because we didn't even have that. But if we were going again, we would have also made like a way to like an electronic order form. Yeah, yeah. IPad. Um, some way to easily take the orders quickly. Yeah. Um, so that was one of the main things, but there's, there's just a lot of learning curve. Like if you don't, if you don't ship your booth there, um, you know, freight, and you want to take it yourself, there were all these rules and restrictions about, you know, what kind of vehicle you could unload yourself. You're not allowed to, like if we brought a U-Haul, you're not allowed to unload a commercial vehicle yourself. There's all of these union regulations. It was very strange. So I I had a panic when I thought that I was going to have to pay them to unload, you know, our U-Haul trailer. So anyway, um, it was just a lot to figure out and there's certain things you can and can't do. Like if you want electricity, you have to pay for everything is extra and you can't just plug in. You have to have their, their, you know, union electrician come and plug you in. Um, different trade shows have more or less Mm. of these rules, but I didn't understand going into it that I had to figure all of this. Okay. So so note to any seller listening to this, a trade show is very different from a craft fair. Yes. It's not the same thing. Yeah. So these big convention centers where trade shows are usually held, um, they all kind of have their different set of rules and they're very specific wow. usually wow i i've been i've i've attended i've never you know been a vendor at any of those at, but i never stopped to think of the small details like 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 the electricity thing you would think there's you know there's electricity in this building why can't i just plug in but right but you have to pay for <laughs> somebody that somebody has to pay for it yeah <laughs> and and there were different rules about 
if you're actually building parts of your booth there, yeah. um, they don't always let you do that yourself. You have to hire one of their, you know, contractors to do certain things. Yeah. I know. Wow. Anyway, it was, it was a learning you see, in my head, I'm already even thinking there probably is a niche business for trade show set up people, like people who just, you know, help people get set up at trade shows because they know all the ins and outs. They they know all the paperwork yes. that needs to be filled, you know, and, and all the applications that you need to put in, all the equipment you need to have and all whatnot. <laughs> there pro- that probably does exist. We were kind of trying to go on a shoestring budget, so yeah, yeah uh, of course you try and figure it out yourself. <laughs> yeah, at the end of the day, would you say it was worth it? Yes, I would definitely say it was worth it. Now, if we had only gotten maybe ten customers versus forty, yeah. um, I'm not I'm not sure if I would have been saying the same thing, but. Yeah. Um, yeah, for us, it definitely felt worth it in the end. Okay. Even even just as we were setting up, I kept saying to my husband, I don't know if this is worth it. Like, this is a lot. I'm very stressed. Like, we're getting it done. We're running on no sleep. Yeah. Spent all this money. Um, yeah. But in the end, I would say, yes, it was worth it. Was it just a one-day event or like a weekend-long event? It was a weekend. Okay. Uh, I think it was three days okay. of being in the booth. Okay. All right. Now, speaking about being efficient, um, right now, at, well, at the time we're recording this, there's a lot going on, you know, with the pandemic, but also okay. most recently, USPS is having a rough time. How are you handling shipping? Because you do high volume. So um, this is a big deal to you if, you know, if things go awry with USPS. What plans do you have in place for, for that? So we're still trying to figure this out right now. Uh, it's very much on my mind. Um, so from, I would say late March through, um, mid May, at least, uh, we were seeing very high shipping times. Um, all of our packages pretty much go through Detroit, which was a pandemic hotspot. So I think these distribution centers that, um, anyway, we're having that problem. We're just like the packages were just sitting there, um, for a week or two before even going anywhere. Um, it was very bad. So I was having customers message me, you know, every single day I would get five or 10 <laughs> customers. It seemed like that would say, it's my package lost. You know oh, where it so is stressful. You know it's coming. And I would say it's not lost, but I don't know when it's coming and there's nothing I can do to find it. And, you know, um, anyway, so we were seeing, I would say three weeks was maybe an average transit time. Mm. And some customers were waiting over a month. Other, other ones seem to get through a little more quickly. I don't really know why. Um, but anyway, I'm very worried about, um, you know, the holiday and the, the fall because that's generally our busy time. Yeah. So we're looking at FedEx, um, but the problem has been that most of our packages ship first class, um, cause they're under a pound. Mm-hmm. So, you know, the, the rate difference for USPS first class, you know, for our packages, it's somewhere around $5 with USPS and the FedEx rates, um, were more like 12 or 13 for the same pack. Um, so since we do have more volume now, we just have been uh, in conversations with our local FedEx rep. Um, and they are, you know, giving us some rate reductions and we're looking at, is it going to make sense or how can we do it? You know, it's still going to be more than USPS um, that we would be paying, but I'm trying to figure out, you know, do we raise prices to compensate, you know, or do we um, try and give a FedEx upgrade on Etsy? Um, I'm pretty sure we can't, like the FedEx doesn't really integrate, right? So like I have a FedEx account with a certain discount now. 
or they're, you know, we're at least in conversation about getting a better volume discount. Yes. Um, but I can't plug that into my Etsy and have those rates show to my customers for them to choose FedEx oh, right. USPS. So I'm still figuring that out. I think what I'm going to end up doing is offering a FedEx upgrade, but really trying to push it everywhere, like put it in the listings. Mm -hmm. You know, USPS is unreliable right now and it's taking so much longer. So please choose the FedEx upgrade. So maybe they'll pay an extra $7 or something, um, which I do have the free shipping over 35 turned on. So I'm also kind of wrestling with that of, you know, if, if it's shipped, you know, they could either pay nothing extra and most orders ship for free, or if they want it to arrive much more quickly, they could pay it, you know, I think it will have to be an extra listing or a drop down menu. I haven't really, it just seems very cumbersome. Like I haven't figured out the best way to do that. Have you looked into something like ShipStation? Um, cause I, I've just, I personally have not used it, but have heard from other sellers that, or, or pirate ship, I think is the other one that I, yeah, uh, I've been hearing about pirate ship and we do use ship station. Okay. So um, uh-huh. yeah. So ship station, I think has some discounted rates for UPS. I'm not sure about FedEx, but with our volume, when you then go to your rep and try and, you know, get the discounts direct from FedEx, I think it will still be better than whatever's built into ShipStation, okay. but it will plug in. So as soon as, you know, we sign on the dotted line with FedEx, if we take this offer that they're giving us for the discounted rates, okay. it will just show up in ShipStation as our options. Okay. Um, so that's what we are currently looking at okay and was there a reason you preferred fedex to ups i'm not sure i I think when i was looking into it last year we knew that we were going to be shipping larger boxes to the wholesale customers okay and so usps for the large heavy things is not as good So I knew I either had to pick FedEx or UPS, and I think I just read a lot of threads on Facebook, and I don't know if there's really a clear winner, Mm -hmm. but at the time, it seemed like most more people were saying they were happy with FedEx, so that's what I went with, but it's, it's not clear to me if it's really better than UPS. It's just, you know, one or the other. One or the other. Yeah, I would imagine. I think they're... They're direct competitors, but, you know, definitely not like USPS in that the rates are, I think their rates will be more on par with each other. And right. USPS is just in a different class. And just for anyone outside the U.S. who is listening to this, USPS is just the United States Postal Service. It's the mail system that we use here. Just FYI. <laughs> Right. And I still don't really have a good option for international. So mm-hmm. I just don't, we don't end up with a lot of ish international orders because um, I don't have free shipping or anything like that turned on for those. They would just have to pay the actual rate, which is very high. It's so I just don't get a lot of international mm-hmm. orders. Yeah. And for, for international, you would just use USPS. Yes, and that's what I've been it. using. Yeah. Um, FedEx, I think, is going to quote us, maybe. Um, We do have a a few wholesale customers in Canada, but they don't order often. So I am looking, you know, still for a better way to send. But it's, yeah, international shipping just seems very high wherever you go. Okay. Well, a bright spot in your business is the light that you've been getting shown, Sean, on your business. I don't know what the tense, the correct tense for that is, but you've been getting featured quite a number of times um, on the Etsy homepage and, and you will have upcoming in the fall, a feature in better homes and gardens. Can we talk about that? Like how, or like, how do you think, or what do you think it is you've done 
to catch the eye of the Etsy editors so that you get featured on their homepage. And for Better Homes and Gardens, how did you get a feature in their magazine? So it's kind of the, the same for both. Um, they just they just find me like they just like I, I think they just like the products and the, the photography. Um, I feel like I have very high quality photos. And um, for Etsy, it hasn't just been the front page. That's only happened maybe two or three times total. Um, but I've also been in the Etsy email that, you know, that right. email I goes remember. out. I got okay. that one. Yeah. Um, and then I've also been on the Etsy Instagram and uh, in their editor's picks. So that's not always on the front page, but you can usually get to some of those. They'll say like uh, the editor's picks are like the gift guides, things like that, where mm. uh, they might put a gift guide on the front page at holiday time and there'll be one for DIY kits, which would be where my stuff would be. Or there's one, you know, gifts for mom, gifts for pets, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, those have been super helpful whenever it happens. It's, it's definitely still a thrill and it, mm-hmm. it does bring in more business. So, um, I think it's just like, I've, I've wanted my products to be, sort of timeless in a way that they're they're not necessarily completely trendy but they're enough on trend that it's it's kind of in line with what etsy is wanting to feature um and then having the right photographs and that seems to be it i mean uh also i think it's the niche so right now needle felting is just pretty popular and etsy's featuring a lot of diy kits kind of, of, of different fiber arts. So I've seen a lot of features of embroidery and punch needle, um, but I just am kind of in the right place at the right time, I think. Yeah. And the same with the, the Better Homes and Gardens. Um, it hasn't come out yet, but it's going to be in there. I think they call it like a holiday craft guide or it's like a craft or craft edition. Um and they just found me on Etsy. So did they reach out to you to ask if they could feature you or to tell you that they were going to feature you? They reached out to ask. Wow. I wonder (laughs) whoever says no. (laughs) Right. Well, there there was a little bit of a process of, um, because they're featuring one of my kit designs. So uh, they wanted instructions written out and I had to send off, um, you know, the actual finished product and, um, you know, sign a legal paperwork and stuff like that. So that's kind of a process and I'm still, I'm very excited about it and I I definitely am am happy I did it, but I didn't get to proof any of it, you know, before it goes to print, like once I signed, it was like, well, they're using this in however a form that they do. And since it's kind of like, I don't even know if they know needle felting or if they have an editor that really knows needle felting. So they could write up the instructions and edit them in a way that, you know, I hope people will still be able to do the project, but I have no say over, you know, the final version. Well, did they, did they say they would give attribution to you with the link to your shop? Or your website? Yes, yes, for sure. I get Oh, okay. So they have my name and I think they'll have my website. Oh, Um, okay, cool. Right. So people can find it, but like, it's just hard for me to let go of like not (laughs) getting to see like the final instructions of what they're going (laughs) to do. Yeah, yeah. Well, that would be great. It would be, uh, I mean, it would be nice to know how that turns out. So I would, I would love to hear about how, how that all works out in the end. And and speaking of, you know, <laughs> wanting to, you know, n- know what the final product is, you, I think part of that is, um, has to do with the fact that you also like to teach and you, well, maybe not right now, but you used to conduct in-person events where you would, you would teach um, people how to do needle felting. Um, at what point? did you feel ready to branch out into 
live classes and and teaching events? I think it was fairly soon after I came out with the kits because Mm -hmm. I teach the kits with a video um, tutorial and, you know, I record that and, you know, edit it and get it ready. And so I usually just teach a kit so they get me live and they can ask questions and I can give them feedback, but it's very similar to what I've already done when I um, do the video. So it, it really was kind of an easy transition, I think. And it was, I think someone just asked me to teach a class and then I've set some up myself. Um, I haven't ever grown like a huge class following. Um, I did some at my local makerspace and um, you know they help to advertise those and then uh, mostly I teach at fiber festivals when we're vending there's usually Mm -hmm. also the opportunity to teach at the fiber festivals Mm -hmm. Um, so that's where I've done most of the teaching but it's just kind of a nice add-on it's a little extra income Um, I like kind of diversifying you know we're trying not to have all of our eggs in the Etsy basket. Right. Yeah. When this pandemic passes and restrictions are lifted, do you think it's something that you would like to get back into doing more of? Yeah, I think that I definitely will. Um, I haven't had the time to really develop a lot of my own schedule. So like I said, I usually am trying to teach at the same shows that we're vending at. Okay. Um, since we're there anyway. Yeah. Um, so obviously this year, all of those events were canceled. Yeah. Um, so yeah, once they start again, um, that's always an easy way for me to teach is if I can do it uh, at an event we're already scheduled for. Okay. And then otherwise, it's just kind of as I find the time or as someone asks me, you know, or as customers ask for a class, um, I'll put something on the schedule. Okay. Now, Elizabeth, as we wrap up, I would like to ask you, you've been on Etsy now for a while. What, if anything, would you change about Etsy if you could? And, but, and before you go into that, what things do you specifically enjoy about the platform? Hmm. Well, the platform has changed a whole lot since the beginning. Um, it, it just had, I don't know, a much different feel in those early days. Mm-hmm. Um, it's gotten to feel bigger and kind of more corporate-y now, mm-hmm. I feel like. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but the platform has been very good to me. So I can't complain too much because, you know, it's still the bulk of our sales mm-hmm. and people find me there. Mm-hmm. So um, there are, you know, I have some frustrations or, you know, I don't always like the Etsy changes, but overall the platform is still, I think, where the customer base is and people find me and Etsy features me. And um, so it's still working, you know, obviously well enough that I'm there and I don't foresee that I would be leaving, you know. Um. In terms of what I would change, I also, I'm in a few Facebook groups for Etsy sellers. So these are just things I've been seeing recently. Some of them um, just stood out to me. Um, So Etsy ads is one that I feel like comes up a lot. Um, Mm -hmm. I never, I've never used it. I feel like as soon as I was like to the point of saying, you know, maybe I should try these promoted listings and like see what everyone's talking about. Then they change them. And I feel like the reviews for Etsy ads have been not not good in general. Mm-hmm. And I tried it for one month and didn't really see, um, you know, many sales from it at all. Mm-hmm. So anyway, I think they should go back to giving us more control Um And I would probably be using it some. And specifically, I think we should be able to choose the keywords that we want to rank for. I think that's how Amazon and these other platforms are, like for um, the pay-per-click. Right, yeah. So 
the Etsy ads would be one thing I would change. Um, something that's been a problem lately is that Etsy still has these estimated delivery dates when people are checking out. Mm -hmm. And that's like completely out the window this year. <laughs> like, yeah. like even if you mail it when, you know, the next day, um, you know, with the way USPS has been, like, there's no telling when they're going to get it, you know, like, it's not anywhere in line with that estimated delivery date. Um, so either take them off, I think, or let us as sellers, like, set what we think is like a reasonable expected right. delivery date, because right now, it's just like, they haven't changed that. But right. so the customers still think it's showing up at a certain time. And mm -hmm. it's just, like so far off right the system didn't anticipate 2020 and right but they have not changed it yeah. yet yeah yeah <laughs> you're right actually um let's see um i've i've had someone uh, that i saw that thought um that the buyer should have to contact the seller before leaving a negative review or a one or two star review because sometimes like it just seems like the the buyers just leave that without realizing what it does to our shop or how important it is, you know. So um, someone thought it should be mandatory that they have to at least like contact contact us, you know, to tell us the problem before they can leave a review. That would actually be nice because then then sellers would have an opportunity to make things right. But right. A lot of those just come out of the blue and, and right. So, and they haven't yeah. even said that there's a problem. Exactly. Yeah. I think that would be a good change. Yeah. And that goes into the ODR thing, um, that I know, you know, people have been quite upset about. Um, mm -hmm. so with the ODR, I also think if, if the buyer changes their review after you have fixed it for them that it shouldn't still count against you which right now I'm pretty sure it still does uh, in that ODR rating have you well, heard I about think, it? yeah so for during this time with the with you know the mail system being you know not as reliable they're not counting those against sellers okay yeah Right. But in other, even before that, or when they were, I don't know, it just seems like if they changed their review, why, why had it still, yeah. you know, yeah. in, in a count, count against us anyway. Um, so the ODR seems quite, you know, kind of rigid harsh. and there's not a lot of yeah, harsh, like not a lot of room for error, even when it's not your fault mm -hmm. necessarily. Um, let's see. On listings, there are a couple things I would like, um, like selling my wool, I have all these colors, but it's essentially the same product. I just would like to have more variations on the listing, but it would be nice if there were more pictures or swatches that I could match to my colors. Cause you know, I would like to have more than 10 colors on a listing, but right now mm. it's, it's kind of hard to show all of them cause you can't, you know, there's not enough pictures or there's not swatches to like match with the different variations. So what do you end up having to do to compensate well, for that? Yeah, I had to break it up. So like mm. I would have put, you know, like in one type of wool, I have like 54 colors or 72 colors. Mm. So I actually would have liked to have a listing with all of them where they're just all on the drop down menu. Okay. But I need a way to have all those pictures in there and, you know. Yeah to see what they're getting so I just had to break it up so I have color families oh, instead yeah I, I saw your color families now I understand why greens so it's yeah and then my other thing with listings is that in the variations you can't specify different weights for different variations so maybe this is just kind of unique to what I do but you know I have different sizes of wool so I, I could have had my different sizes on the same listing, but I can't change their weight. So like one eighth of an ounce, you know, if you're getting a bunch of those, it would be much different shipping wise than if you're getting a bunch of one ounces. Mm -hmm. So like I couldn't put my different weights, you know, of things in the same listing. Wait, I don't the, I mean, you mean the uh, weight of the wool? Yes. Yeah, so the weight, like I sell the wool in different amounts. 
So one is a little tiny ball of wool and one is a big ball of oh, wool. Oh, I see, I but see. I would have preferred just to have that all on the same listing where they pick the amount that they want, like I want the little one or yeah. I want the big one. But since I couldn't change the weight, it just seemed like I couldn't make the shipping work out. Oh, I see. So now you have to split them into separate, two separate listings at least. Right. Okay. Yeah, I okay. just ended up not even putting the smaller amounts on. Oh. Um, because there's not much profit in those with the way the fee structure is anyway. Oh, I see. Okay. And, um, but anyway, a few more capabilities within the listings would be nice, I think. I think we already talked about like the different shipping options. Like if I could plug in my FedEx rates or even turn off yeah. USPS mm -hmm. and just force people into choosing FedEx, yeah. like so they would get it quickly. Um, so it would be nice if there was a little more um, capability or flexibility within the shipping um, options. Okay. Yeah. And I yeah. think that's mostly it um, in terms of my, my things I would like to see. Yeah. You know, from, from what you've said, I think in some ways that reflects the, Oh, I don't know what the word I want to use is, but kind of the the growth that Etsy has experienced but you know the some of the the root or early early ways of doing things that they haven't yet figured out how to grow out from so say for instance like you know for what you're doing needing more options for colors Whereas in the beginning, when it was more, caught, when Etsy was, you know, in its infant stages and, and sellers hadn't yet, you know, grown to say, you know, the level of volume that you're doing and what you're offering, you know, mm -hmm. the platform was more limited because sell sellers were more limited um, in what they were able to do. And now that, you know, Etsy has grown and people are, are finding the platform more and and sellers are now able to do more and offer more, in some ways the platform is still in in, in some in some areas still in those infant stages where it's still offering things as those sellers, you know, have not yet been able to expand, if that makes sense. Yeah, I, I think I, I think I get what you're saying. Yeah, I mean, Shopify has a lot more capability of what you can do within the listings and that kind of thing. Um, but a lot of it is also the plugins, you know, the the extra apps oh, you have right. to buy to make yeah. it all work. Yeah. So, so I understand Etsy has to, you know, kind of make these changes slowly and roll out the things that make the most yeah. sense for most yeah. sellers. Um, Investing yeah. in the infrastructure, I think, is needs you know is well should be part of their growth plan. In addition to you know, like I guess they pick where they want to focus on. Like now, it's ads and offsite ads. Well, frankly, um, I yeah, I don't like that we have we don't we don't have an opt out for the offsite ads. Right. Um, that was also on my list, but you know, I would rather be paying like a seller, like at, at my volume that I am, I would rather give them more of my money to have some of these capabilities. Like, yeah. like they never did really roll out that final Etsy plus or what was that? I, that was going to, I was going to ask you if you um, were involved in that. I mean, you know, had subscribed to that. And if, I mean, I know that wouldn't offer any additional tools, at least not what, what not what you would need. Right. But yeah. I, Never did do that, but I would be willing to pay more if I got mm -hmm. some of these tools that were mm -hmm. things that I actually needed. Yeah. Um, right now, I feel like, you know, they, they really push the free shipping and they've, you know, we're in the offsite ads that we can't opt out of. So 12%, you know, that's like a big chunk, it's a chunk. that I don't necessarily want to be paying. <laughs> and have um, you seen sales result from that? I do get sales from offsite ads, um, but I think I always have because I would notice I would get, you know, like last Christmas, I would get little spikes um, in sales like in November 
And I would even have um, friends or business colleagues that would say, oh, I saw your kid on Facebook, really? you know, and it was promoted. Ad. So it was Etsy promoting my ad on, oh. or my, on Facebook. Um, yeah, there's ways to look in your stats. Um, so mm. basically, I was getting a lot of views um, coming in from social media. And I don't promote on myself on social media very much at all. Okay. So I knew that was that Etsy was promoting my and stuff. Something. And now and that, you get to pay for them, I guess. Oh, sorry. I, we were both talking. Oh, what sorry. Did? I said, and now you get to pay for them. Right. So I think for years, Etsy has been using my stuff in offsite ads, mm. which is obviously benefiting me. And people would say, well, maybe now, you know, now I have to pay for it. And, um, but I always felt like it was more of a win win because my thing that I created was bringing new people to the platform. Right. Even if it was good enough for them to be using. Um, but now we pay for it. Yeah. So, yeah, I have looked at how much how many of my orders come from offsite ads, but I still get definitely regular orders from offsite. Yeah. Well, we'll see what the future holds in that. I I know there's a lot of pushback coming for that, so let's let's see how Etsy responds to to that. I mean, now I mean the pushback can only be verbal because, like you said, you know sellers don't really get a choice um but maybe if they're listening uh that might make a difference right so etsy if you want to make more money <laughs> but with giving sellers choice um i would pay for some of these tool upgrades yeah. <laughs> so that capability on my listings or in my shipping yeah and maybe those tool upgrades can be rolled into well, what would it be? Etsy Premium, because Etsy Plus was the one they actually came oh, out right. with, and then yeah. Etsy Premium was the one that was. That's going on like two years now, huh? I yes, think. they've never come out with that, right? So interesting. Oh. I don't know what what it, what that's going to be. Yeah, Elizabeth. Oh my goodness! Thank you so much for sharing. It's what eleven years of experience on Etsy and off Etsy, growing growing on the platform and beyond. This is so much to take in. And and I think it's encouraging for, you know, especially sellers who are like in, in the mid stages of expanding to get a glimpse into where they could possibly go. You know, I, I'm, I'm glad you talked about investing in growth because it's, you know, sometimes it's what you need to do when you hit a certain level in order to keep growing. So I'm glad that we got to talk about that and um, and what you've done so far. What do you think the future holds for Felted Sky? Well, I'm just hoping that we keep growing. I mean, I always have ideas for new kits. <laughs> so um, at some point, we'll probably have to move out of the house. <laughs> The business, the business is very close to needing its own space yeah. or a bigger house. Um, one of the two. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think the future is bright and it's, it's a lot to do with needle felting just because it still has growth. Okay. You know, uh -huh. that much. Yeah. Well, I, I'm impressed to see that, you know, you've gone from, you know, you're starting out as a stay at home mom to growing this, you know, enterprise, or at least it's on its way to being an enterprise. So congratulations on all that you've achieved. Oh, thank you so much. You are welcome. And, and thank you for being my guest. I really have appreciated talking with you. And if anyone wants to connect with you, or if they have questions that maybe we didn't get to um, about something that you're doing, What's the best way for them to connect with you? Um, probably either our website, which is feltedsky.com or uh, the Etsy shop. You know, I check both of those a lot. I am also on Facebook and Instagram, so I will, um, you know, also get it that way. But generally um, through one of the, the shop or the website. Okay. And I have links to everywhere you can connect with Elizabeth. So I will put them in the show notes for this episode 
um, uh, her Etsy shop, which again is Felted Sky and her website FeltedSky.com as well as social media. Elizabeth, thank you again for being my guest. I have so enjoyed talking with you and I do hope we can catch up again because I really think that you're you're heading somewhere that neither of us know right yet. So okay. <laughs> if we can do that, I would be really happy to have you back on the podcast. Yes, I would love to do that. We should definitely check in again and I'm sure I'll learn even more by then. And I'm sure you I feel will. like I'm still always learning, even though I've done all of this. Um, we didn't talk as much about mistakes, but um, I think that's that's something I always come back to is that you don't have to get everything right. I mean, I don't do much with social media. I don't really have a newsletter, um, you know, and there's there's definitely still mistakes, but it's like if you just do enough that works, you can still keep moving forward. I like that. If you do enough that works, you can still keep moving forward. I like that. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. And I thank you for listening to the podcast. I will be back again next week. Oh, you can connect with me, um, convome.com. You can use the contact form there. If you would like to be on the podcast, just click on the Be My Guest tab. And um, if you want to connect with me socially, um, you can do so right now. Probably Instagram is the best place at Convome Podcast. And I will be back with another episode next week. Thank you for listening. You can subscribe to the podcast in iTunes. And while you're there, please leave a review too. visit convome.com to leave a comment or feedback on this episode.